We are live for the first time, and as we get started here, be sure to let us know as you log in. Um, this is our first time going live, so we're still kind of figuring it out. And of course, technology decided to go ahead and uh, throw us for the loop just right off the bat. Um, I've got a list of questions here that some group of folks have submitted. We've got probably uh, six or seven questions to go through, so that's going to be a pretty good deal. And hey there, Tanya, thanks for tuning in. Um, we're looking forward to having everybody. Those are really good response. And I know there's going to be several people that couldn't make it with us this evening. So uh, we're definitely going to be posting this live video to our YouTube channel and then back here on our Facebook page for anybody that may not be able to um, view it tonight because we know we got a lot of folks got other things going on. But um, like I just said, guys, as you tune in, go ahead and uh, let us know that you're here because it's always good to see. I can't see um, who all's logging in, but I can kind of see the numbers taken up at the top. So, um, and then if you guys have any questions about what I'm discussing this evening from the group of questions that was submitted, we've got a good different range. Um, see my mom just tuned in. That's fun. They're down in North Carolina and um, some other folks from Kentucky and Ohio, it looks like. So um, we'll go ahead and uh, get started uh, with the first question. I know that uh, Linda had submitted a question and she's not going to be able to tune in with us. So I'll go ahead and approach her question for you guys. It was a real good question. And Linda asked, how would I approach a horse that may have a brace in the backup? And then what would I do um, to work with the horse that has a, bra like a brace in the backup? And so just in a general sense, one of the first things I do with a horse that if I know they're going to have a brace in the backup, then usually it's a pretty green issue. So what we'll do is I'll check on the lateral flexion. That's usually a pretty safe thing to go ahead and check. And then if we're in the halter, which I would rather start with that before putting like a snaffle on them or anything like that, we'll, um, I would end up gra grabbing the halter, those rope halters, just below the knot. And I don't, I don't like to pull straight back to their chest. Um, we don't do that when we're riding. It doesn't make any sense. So instead, I won't do any backwards notion, but rather I'll go side to side until their feet come loose. And with a horse that's bracing the back up, they're stuck in their feet and they're not thinking down to their feet. So that it would be my whole goal is saying, okay, we're going to ask you to go back. And as soon as they go back, as soon as they take one step back, I get out and reward them for it. And we just start building on that. And we'll start to build until they start to get repetitive steps back. And then we'll require for them to start backing on a soft feel and a more of a collected kind of look. And so um, that's really what I look forward um, in a general sense for a bracy horse that's in the backup. Um, you really try to keep it really easy for them and just get to the feet. And there's other things we can do in terms of teaching them to lead by their feet, which I've got a colt right now that um, he is bracing the back up, uh, whether you're on the ground or in the saddle. And so one of the things I've been doing with him is teaching him to lead by his feet. It's really helped because he, when he showed up, he led like a sack of bricks and he just kind of drag around you. And so that has been a real big thing for us is trying to get him thinking with his feet. He had a job and, um, just kind of had to go forward and be safe and that was about it. So that's kind of how I would go about um, addressing a horse that's bracy in the back, in the back up. So um, be sure guys, um, as we got started here just a few minutes ago, um, be sure to let us know where you're tuning in from uh, and uh, who all's tuning in. I can't see who's tuning in. It looks like we're about 12 people or so right now, which is pretty neat for the first go. And be sure to let us know who you're tuning in. I see Tanya already let us know, but, um, and we'll keep moving to these questions. And I'm going to go through these questions here on the list. And if you guys submitted questions, submitted questions, definitely let us know that you're here. Cause I'm going to kind of start working my way through the list in hopes that you guys are here since I can't tell who is, but that first question on the backup was from Linda and she's not going to be able to join us this evening but she already mentioned that she wanted to go back and watch the video. So we've got her all squared away and, um, Hey there, Cheryl, it's good to see you. Thanks for tuning in with us. Um, 
Uh, I wasn't going to be able to make it to the meeting on Saturday since it's up in Indiana, but definitely with you guys there in spirit and looking forward to competing with you guys at the KRHA shows this year with One Smart Ace, so that's going to be a good time. And hey there, Paula, thanks for tuning in. Appreciate that. And so I'm going to go to the next question. It's from Patrick and as you guys may have seen, I've got a new gray horse. He's actually the first horse I've ever owned uh, named Teton. He's a Dakota horse up from North Dakota. And he's a seven-year-old. And Patrick asked what I thought of Teton and the Nakotas. Um, Teton is a seven-year-old. And he's hasn't... I put a couple rides on him so far. And he... Um, He's been a real interesting horse. Uh, notoriously, I haven't worked with any Dakotas prior to him, and he had gone ahead, and they had, notoriously what I have been explaining was they were pretty easy horses to start, and he's definitely not. And one of the horsemen, a good friend of mine, uh, Patrick King, you all should be sure to check his stuff out. Um, he travels the country, and he got me hooked up with getting this horse, and he said, in the right hands, this horse could be magnificent, but in the wrong hands, he could be treacherously dangerous. So that's that's a big shoes to fill for sure. And this horse, I've only had him now for about three or four weeks, and he's taught me so much. He's super sensitive. It's unreal how aware this horse is. He comes from a line known as the Watchers, and he lives up to it 100%. He will he he knows exactly where i am every part of me at any given time and his will to survive is unreal i mean he truly just wants to be okay with everything but he also um is has that pure instinct just to survive so he's been very nice. he's going to teach me a bunch um that's for sure and we're taking it as slow as we need to go we put several rides on him and i've gone backwards and we're going to um, just build a foundation as slow as we need to. This horse, he, I, you know, as being part of my team, I preach, whether I'm at clinics or in lessons, that we shouldn't really be in a rush with our horses and that the goals for deadlines and shows and stuff is not something I'm particularly too interested in myself. So I want to do what's best for these horses. And for him, it's going to be a very slow and steady race and, you know, we're going to, we're going to win it. I'd really like to make him a bridle horse, uh, Lydia, that goes along with your question. I want to take him through that Vaquero style and I'm going to, my goal is to start him in the Hackamore, keep him in the Hackamore and we might play around with the snaffle as well, but then eventually take him up to the two rein and into the bridle. And so they'd go through that process. And so, uh, Patrick also asked how tall he was, um, Teton. I, they measured him right before I picked him up and they said he was about 15 to, um, but he is built, and he's a very thick and wide and very strong horse. So he's gonna, it's going to be an exciting thing. I'm looking forward to working with him and keeping you guys posted on that. So definitely stay tuned. Um, so it looks like we've got about 15 folks joining us. Guys, thanks for jun 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 da -da. Sorry, guys, uh, joining us here. And, uh, I'm going to keep on moving down the line to Kathy asked us, um, at a clinic or a trail ride, do I still ground tie or tie to the trailer? And then the second part of her question was, do I ground tie when I tack up and then tie them with a hay bag when I'm not riding? Um, this kind of goes along the lines. I put up a video just a couple days ago about horses that are fidgety when you go to saddle your horses. And so she commented on that video asking this question. And I wanted to include it because I feel like a lot of you guys could also benefit from it. Um, when I tack up any of my horses and saddle them, they're not tied up. And if they were tied up the rope, I would either have it in my arm or if it's on like a really smooth pole, it might just be looped through, but it's not double wrapped or anything like that. And so that if they did back up or they moved or something, they wouldn't have any friction on the halter. And that's just because if they do... Um, for some reason get concerned about when I'm saddling them, then we don't want them it to turn into a fiasco where they hit that halter really hard and it turns into a big problem. We just want them to go ahead and um, go through that process. So when I'm on a trail ride or an event that 
I'm, they're not notoriously used to, whether they're on a trail or a clinic or something like that, then I will most definitely um, have a hold of the halter when I saddle them. And if, depending on the horse, you know, one that's super sensitive, I might just keep a hold of them the whole time. And other times, you know, they'll be tied up to the side of the trailer or to a hitching post or something like that to where they can hang out. But um, I, I don't treat it as any anything different if, than if at home. I tack all my horses up either in the arena, in the barn aisle, and that's, you know, it's just really routine for them. Wherever I say, hey, you need to stand here, they stand there. And we try to go about doing it that way. Now, if they get to moving, that's where that video came in about having a counter move to where if they decide to move to the left, I'll move them back to the same spot. And I kind of picked a spot where they want to go. If they want to move forward, I'll back them up. If they want to back up, I'll move them forward. And it's just a bit of a learning curve until those horses realize that their job in that moment is to stand still. And once they really get to realizing that and then then it's just part of the routine. It's just like when I teach them to bridle that they drop their head down and that's their job in that moment. And they start to reach for you. They start to understand it. And when they understand it, they're really content with it because it's a routine. So um, then she also asked uh, when I'm not riding them, do I time up with the hay bag? I'm huge on hay nets in their stalls here at the farm. They've got hay nets up there um, all the time. And then when I'm traveling in the trailer, of course, they've got hay nets up there. So uh, I'm real big on that. I'd like to keep hay in front of them, you know, 75% of the time as much as I can and keep them pretty happy and really helps with the ulcers and stuff like that. So I'm kind of a geek when it comes down to their <laughs> digestive health. So um, guys, as you're tuning in, um, before you head out and everything, just be sure to let us know that you're here and uh, comment below. I can kind of see when you guys pop in with your uh, pictures, but I don't always know who it is. And so um, be sure to comment below. Let us know that you're here and appreciate you guys tuning in. And then be sure to, if you got any questions throughout this, we've covered uh, so far about, uh, we've talked about Teton a little bit, uh, the new gray horse that I just got in. I'm having the privilege to work with. And we've talked about a question from Lydia that was talking about a horse that would have a brace in the back up and how we'd approach that. So if you guys got any questions about the, about um, anything along those lines or anything else, be sure to let us know. But we've got a few more to go here, so um, we'll keep on ticking through. And so on to the next one. Uh, we'll, get, we'll stick with the saddling theme. Uh, Kathy King or Catherine King, she was actually the one I got Teton from. She mentioned in that saddling video she says how would i approach a horse that hesitates when they are being saddled and hey there debbie thanks for tuning in um when we uh when we have a horse that is hesitant i asked her for a little bit of clarification so and i hadn't heard back from her so the best i can reckon is that when you go to throw a saddle pad or a saddle on top that they might flinch, they might look at it, they may not move their feet away and get fidgety, but they might just have a bit of unsureness about them. And so when this happens, I am completely comfortable doing as many times as necessary. We will, um, if I'm throwing the saddle up there, then what I'll end up doing is I'll take the saddle off, I'll take the saddle pad off and We'll throw it again. And if they hesitate, as soon as the saddle lands, I reach up and rub on them. I'll rub on them all day and, and say, hey, nope, you're all right. Like, you don't need to go anywhere. Like, this is your spot. And they, at that point, if they're just hesitating, they know they're supposed to stand still because they want to be good. They want to stay in there and they want to, um, they don't want to feel like they have to leave. But for whatever reason, something in that moment made them feel like they had to go somewhere. And so, if they do need to go somewhere, that's fine. Go with them. You know, try not to let your attack hit the ground or something like that because that just kind of escalates it. But stick with them. And as soon as they get their feet stopped, rub on them. And then just work from them there. Like you might take them back to your where you originally had them. But in those moments where they might hesitate about it, then I would 100%. And as soon as they get their feet stopped, I'd rub on them. And then I'd keep doing it. And I wouldn't. And I usually, I like the number three, if I can go and saddle them up, you know, three times in a row without them flinching or hesitating, like I've got one now and he, his thing is 
he's a different horse. He'll occasionally, two days in a row, he'll turn up the same, but sometimes he doesn't always um, come out about sure everything. So we have to go back a lot and still re like cover a bunch of things that we did the day before or even weeks before. And that's just his MO right now. We're really working on uh, He's got a lot of baggage, so he's been a big learning tool as well. But he still will go to throw the saddle pad up there, and he'll be fine. You go to the saddle, and you'll just see he, he kind of flinches, and it'll kind of like shy and look at it, but he won't move. And so I'll take the saddle off and the saddle pad back off, and then I'll just keep going until he just stands there. And usually when they lick and chew and they hang out, you know you're in a good spot. And so um, I just... I keep after it and keep reassuring them that when they stand and they hang out that they are um, they're doing the right thing they can be comfortable comfortable about it but I would not move forward until they are completely comfortable and confident and they're okay with what everything if they still look concerned and you move on um, it's just going to escalate throughout the session because you have left them a little unsure and you're going to leave a hole in something that you could have gone back through and tried to fill and help them out with. So that's how I, with the information I had based on the question, that's how I would go about um, working with a horse that might be hesitant when being saddled. Um, saw Vanessa, saw you tuned in. Hey, Billy, hope everything's going well for you boys out there in Missouri. Uh, it'd be good to see you guys again here sometime soon, hopefully down the road. Hope everything's going well for the family. And hey there, Rachel. Thanks for tuning in. Appreciate that. I'm sure we'll see you guys here soon as well. And so be sure, let us know you're here, guys. Um, we got about 18 folks, it looks like. No, 19. So it's, it's staying around there, which is really, really cool because uh, this is the first one I've done. So we had a little technical difficulties at the beginning trying to get it all figured out. But um, And it's a little more fun because usually when I'm making the videos for you guys, I'm talking to a phone that I know that you guys will be seeing later on but it's still just me and an empty barn and just a couple horses so now at least i got some interactions from you guys and i know you guys are here which is pretty neat um, we wouldn't be able to do what we do for you guys and gianna oh it's good to see you um we haven't uh it's been a while so definitely hope to see you guys soon and uh let us know if you're down in kentucky that would be awesome and hopefully i'll be able to get up your guys way as well um, as for desensitizing uh, that's a good, very good topic. Um, is there anything particular that you're trying to do, or is it just a general desensitizing? Because there's a lot of different things from uh, just a basic flag to, you know, gunfire to a roping. Um, I mean, you could consider, if they're that scared of the trail, saddling a new colt. Well, we just talked about um, quite a bit of saddling, and so that whole process to me in terms of a new colt and when you're going to saddle them for the first time, you know, I'll start from the very basics. I mean, you have to address something being on them, something touching them. You have to address the cinch and also like your front cinch and your back cinch. There's a lot of different parts that I try to cover and break it down for them. So um, I start with the flag. Um, the flag is my one of my best friends. I love the flag, and that's uh, once they're comfortable with me rubbing them down, I'll go flag and just rub them all over with it. And after that, I'll go. I have a little blue Navajo pad that's really flexible because I ride all of mine in a CSI pad, and it's really stiff. So I like that Navajo pad because I can kind of ball it up and rub them down with it, and then I can also stretch it out across them, and so. Um, I use that a lot and then I'll go to my CSI pad. So the CSI pad, because it's stiff, it's, you can fold it in half and rub them with it. But usually when you say it's going to sit perfectly on top of them and it's going to be on both eyes. So I try to be really cognizant that when I rub them, I'm on one side and then I go to the other side and then they get comfortable with me reaching across their back and getting further Sammy from both eyes. And that's a real big thing. And then I'll go through the roping process. Um, I'm, you know, you see cult starting competitions, people sometimes overdo the flank roping and stuff like that to get a bit of reaction of them. I'm not into it. Um, I address the cinch because a lot of them do have, um, they can be a bit cinchy because the first time they've kind of never had any pressure on that part of their body. So we'll be sure to, you know, toss a loop over them and start with the front cinch and then work our way back. And as soon as they work it, work through it, just get in and get out and be done with it. 
and we'll keep moving on. And usually the big thing is getting them comfortable with moving around with something um, on them. So I will lead them a little bit with the saddle pad. I don't do too much of it because sometimes the saddle pad will shift. And if you get them to where they get worried about it and they get to kind of running, then they'll fling your saddle pad off. And then they're like, oh, I knew I had something to be worried about. So I don't, I do a little bit of it, but then when it comes down to the saddling and I've done my groundwork with my flag to where I can get them moving around me, but then I can rub them with that flag while they're moving around, then they get super comfortable with something like the stirrups and everything like that. And I'll keep them on a halter and lead as soon as I, I don't saddle them and then turn them loose because what happens is if they get worried, I mean, it's fine. You know, I, I, if one's going to buck, I'd like for them to go ahead and kind of be honest about it. Cause sometimes you'll get that third ride and fourth ride and there might be something that you didn't quite get. And so I'll definitely try to, um, keep them on a halter and lead and their first steps be forward. And if they go to get worried, then I'd go back to getting their hindquarters and change directions. And I'll try to help them out of it. And as soon as they smooth out, then I'll turn them loose and work them around the round pin. And if they get worried out there, I'll do the same thing. I'll try to change directions. But a lot of times they need to work through it and they need to realize, hey, it's all right. It's not going to hurt. It's not going to be a big deal. And um, I really break that process down. But if you really... If you're watching your horse's eye and you've covered both sides and you've got them comfortable with seeing um, objects in, in opposite eyes, so if you're on the left and, they, and you can reach across them and they get comfortable with stuff like that, as long as you practice saddling, Joe Walter is a phenomenal horseman and he talks about practice saddling on the fence. And, you know, I, my saddle is about 45 to 50 pounds and so... Um, I get plenty of practice saddling my horses every day, but when I'm going to particularly do colts, like I'll throw up against the fence quite a while and make sure that when I go to throw it, that those stirrups land smooth. I don't hit them in the rump and they just land smooth on the other side because that can startle one when, one, when those stirrups come across and they hit them in the shoulders. And so you don't want to do that. You want to be able to just kind of lay it up there. And so I go through that and usually it's not a big deal. Um, you know, occasionally one will get worried about it and you got to stick with it and hope that you can kind of work them through it because they, they'll make it. They'll make it. If, you, if you're in it and you're believing in them, they'll make it. And, John, I know you're a good hand, so, I mean, if you've got a cult coming on that uh, that you're trying to get one saddled or something like that, uh, you'll I know you'll definitely um, get it worked out and you've got my number so you can definitely give me a ring any time. It says, once you get a horse going comfortable in a snaffle, do you graduate, graduate to other bits? What kind? Um, so with my, you know, it depends on what they're going to do. I ride a lot in the snaffle and the hackamore, and they're interchangeable. Uh, I really like the hackamore because it really works. You've, you can't, on the snaffle, you can kind of make a horse do something. I'm not saying you should, but I'm saying you can. And... In a hackamore, if you get bracing on a horse, they're going to brace back and good luck holding on because it's a noseband. It's a raw high noseband or a latigo noseband. So um, it's one of those things that I would most definitely, um, I like a snaffle on a hackamore. And with the horsemanship that I enjoy, like you would be going up into another bit, which would be something comparable to a half breed. So it's not a spade bit. And it's a mild, more mild port. And that's just that Vaquera horsemanship that I have a strong passion for. I've ridden in other um, ported bits. And it really, I guess, depends on what you want to do with your horse. Um, I just bought a new setup. And I don't have it here with me to show you. But the bit style is called a Mona Lisa. It's really similar to a half breed. It's got a um, copper hood on the top of it with a cricket, which is just a roller in the back end so that your horses can salivate and they can roll that cricket. And, you know, compared to some bits, it's got a, a bigger port, but it's a good, it's a handmade bit that is going to be good for what I want to do with that one smart ace Appaloosa stallion, which is taking him into this ranch horse stuff. So I'm going to be introducing him to that through the two rein, and the two reins a hackamore with a bridle setup, um, with the bridle bit. And he'll just be packing the bridle bit for a while while I still ride off the hack, the, the hackamore piece. So, um, 
I'm not really big on bit collecting. You know, I've got my Snaffle, I've got my Hackmore, and I've got now this uh, Mona Lisa set up. And, you know, you can, I'd much rather see people investing in their horse's education and really, you know, you can invest in your horse's education by sending them to somebody. I do ride horses for the public, but um, we're looking at reworking some things. And I, my passion is working with you guys and your own horses because at the end of the day, I can send your horse back to you. And just because, um, somebody who does strive to make a living doing this and ride horses every day, you know, it doesn't always do the horse good when they go home because sometimes people don't always have the best understanding of how to operate the horse, even though the horse understands it. So I'd like to see people investing in their own education as well as their horse's education so that when you guys get home, you guys can get some stuff done and keep that education going and building that foundation. So, um, Jerry, thanks for tuning in. I hope you guys are doing well down there. And um, we'll hopefully, we'll get to see you guys at some shows this year. I want to do some roping and everything like that. It'll be a good time. Uh, hopefully you'll be at the Peter Campbell Clinic here in a couple weeks. That'll be a blast as well. Uh, Lydia asks, have you worked much with mules? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't say much, but I did start two mules uh, while I was here at the University of Kentucky here in Lexington. Um, it was probably... I'd say about three years ago now. Um, their names, one was, their names were Tall and Smalls. And uh, I don't know if y'all heard that. My fiance is laughing in the other room because, you know, she knows where this is going. But uh, yeah, so they, uh, Talls and Smalls, they were some, you know, Smalls and I really, you know, we had some good times together. We got up in the morning, we got early, and we chased some deer around and stuff like that. He went on pretty good, but, you know, they, they taught me quite a bit. They were, they were different, you know. I, some people swear by them, and, you know, I didn't, it wasn't that I disliked them. Smalls was eight, and he hadn't been started, and Tall was ten, and he hadn't been started. Tall had a lot of baggage on top of other things, and so we put 30 to 45 days on him. And he was going all right, but he just had spots for what they wanted to do with him that were like, listen, it's just not worth it. Like, you know, he's lived out in a pasture this long, and they weren't really hard-pressed to get him started. They just wanted to see if it could be done and how they would go. Smalls, on the other hand, he, you know, he was a solid little mule. He, he kind of did it what he wanted to, and uh, he... Uh, he was a fun little guy. He, he taught me quite a bit. And, uh, yeah, we got to chase some deer in the mornings and stuff like that. And, uh, I think one of the best quotes I heard about mules was I got, uh, Ray Hunt's, one of Ray Hunt's audio CDs for Christmas. And he said, you know, if you try to get along with a horse and it was something to this effect, at least that, you know, you're working with a horse and, uh, in the parts that you might miss, they'll fill in for you and they might make your life a little easier, but with a mule, he is they'll they'll make your life hard because um god made a horse but he said god didn't make a mule <laughs> and so when i heard that the first time i i thought that was pretty good because yeah that little that little mule he definitely would make things a little bit harder on you sometimes if um if he could so but i enjoyed him he was fun he i won't ever forget him that's for sure hey there ruth um teton's doing well um really um, enjoying working with him. I uh, did share a little bit about him in the beginning, but I'll just kind of touch on if anybody's here that um, wasn't here at the very start. But he's going well. We're taking it real slow and building this foundation. Um, put a several rides on him, and now we're going back and really, really di dicing up what I'm used to doing and building as slow as we can for him. I mean, He's today, the last two days, he's been really coming along. He looks forward to going to work and everything like that. So he's meeting me at the gate and I'm working first thing in the morning. So this morning I didn't end up getting to work him and I turned him out and he kind of looked at me and he was like, oh, what the heck? So um, I'm really looking forward to where we're going with him, but we're taking it as slow as he needs it and what's going to work best for him. So he's a super neat guy and definitely blessed to call him that. We're definitely blessed to call this horse my first horse, that's for sure. So, y'all keep asking questions. Um, hey there, Eb. Hope you're doing well. Um, not sure if you're back stateside. Hopefully so. It'll be good to ride with you here soon. And uh, maybe chase some cows and do some roping and stuff like that. So, 
Um, I've got a couple more questions, but y'all be sure um, to let us know that when you tune in, and then be sure to let us know if you have any questions. Gianna, thanks for your questions, and Lydia, thanks for yours as well as we're kind of moving through this stuff. Um, then we had, uh, let's see. Well, I had, well, I kind of covered a couple of them all together. So um, that's the questions, guys, that I've had written down. Um, if you guys, if you guys have any questions that come to mind as we're working through this, um, I've had a lot of people talking and asking about bridling horses and the bridling and uh, issues dealing with bridling. I did, I've done several lessons just in the last two weeks where I've gone out to people's farms and helped with their horses bridling as well as um, had somebody from South America contact me and they said that they had a mare that just wasn't having she wouldn't open her mouth she'd pitch her head and unfortunately you know that sometimes is the story with those horses that kind of get bad to bridle um, but that has been a real common theme and um, you know, I'll go ahead and touch on that since it has been. I'm not, I'm not sure if anybody here that's watching uh, finds that, but maybe somebody down the road that will watch this video will. And for those horses that become bad to bridle, um, it's a big a bit of a process for me. Um, when I go to halter my horses, I like for their head and neck, and I'll kind of move here so you guys can see, that I like their head to be kind of like right here. Uh, I'm not looking over their heads because I don't want them to come up and smack me in the face, but I want them to kind of be slightly turned with their neck and their heads very their ears are even so they're not tipped with their nose because sometimes they'll get their nose tipped towards you and they're looking the other direction like they're ready to go so i want them just very flat and they're right there in front of me and they're kind of where you can cuddle them a lot and so when i get ones working that way i'll take them in the halter and i'll have them bent that direction and i here recently i've really found that sometimes you can take your hand and you try to like if they go away, you can kind of pull them back. Well, they get really, I found, bracy if you're constantly pulling them back. So what I do is I'll, right in those rope halters, um, I would just hold uh, my fingers in between their cheek and that rope. And if they go to move away, they just, that rope comes tight on my hands and they run into the pressure on the outside. And I've stopped. What I'll end up doing is I'll run my hand up there. And if they don't move their head down towards me, then I'll just kind of guide them with the halter. So it's not even about my hands anymore. It's more about the halter. And so, because they're already so acquainted with that feel of being flexed laterally, being backed up. If they're ridden in a hack more than maybe even some vertical flexion in that sense. And so I like to get them to where they'll drop their head. And it's not a fixed position. This was something I touched on with somebody else. It's not a fixed position. Um, this is just the spot that I'm asking them to be in that moment. Uh, I, with them putting their, with me being able to move their head, I like to be able to ask them to put their um, head all the way down to the ground and I could raise it up if I wanted to. But in that moment, when it comes to haltering and bridling, I like them to be right there. Um, just kind of around my torso for everybody, depends on how tall you are and stuff like that. But it's, I've here recently, it's really become about the halter and asking them to and then for a bridle i'll leave the rope halter on to work on the bridling and work around their muzzle if they don't like being touched there uh this one little mare she had just learned to pitch her head and so we had this first we we're like hey no why don't you keep coming back here and saying this is the good spot and every time she got there you could rub on her but then she'd she'd be really crafty and she'd know exactly when you wanted to actually use the bit and so she'd pitch her head and so I was just like, okay, that's fine. If you want to put your head in the roof, then and I just went with her. And I said, and as soon as she went up there, she was like, I don't really want to hold my head up here um, because it's not comfortable. And then she started to come back. And, you know, it took a while for that little mare. But eventually we got it. We bridled her several times, and she was cool with it. And she packed the bit around while we did some groundwork. And the next day her owner texted me, and she said, it only took 10 minutes. And, guys, that's what it's about, like, you know, that next day, like she had spent two weeks and like more than an hour every day for two weeks trying to get this mare bridled. And she would just let the horse pack it. And even I went out there and we spent, you know, around an hour trying to get that horse bridled. 
and really working with her. And like, it wasn't just that we, we could have got her bridled, but we were really working on the process and showing her that what the good deal was for her to be down there in that spot. And then the next day she texts me and she said she only took 10 minutes and she packed around and she wasn't chomping on the bit during the groundwork. And you know, that to me, um, it's about the horses and it's about you guys being able to get the stuff done. So that's pretty neat. Um, so I hope that helps clarify anything for people that might have some uh, questions in terms of bridling. And so I think we got a few more questions here. Technique used for first touch with your new guy. Um, Rachel, are you talking about with Teton about how I got like how I was able to rub on him for the first time? We'll give her a second here um, to maybe provide a little bit of clarification. For that and then I'll go ahead and read out the next one it says Ruth says okay so she said yeah so with him with Teton the first time I actually got my hands on was that first touch part of that video the one in a thousand the Teton video that's been kind of going around here a little bit he that was the first touch that I had like I, that in that video was the footage of the first time I actually, you know, got to pet on him and everything like that. And so, um, with him, you know, it was interesting because the lady that I got him from has had him kind of in a, she's had him at her place for a year and a half where he was essentially detoxing. Cause he went through some not so good experiences before she was able to uh, bring him into her place. And so we, you know, she knows that horse very well. And so with him, you know, I was super excited uh, to be able to, you know, just see him in person. I'd seen some pictures of him, but I, she had already worked with him on being able to stay with her. She hadn't done, she had done more quote unquote liberty stuff with him. And so with him, I just kind of went in there and hung out with him and we, and he kind of came up and nosed me and sniffed me a little bit. And then he'd block off because there was hay in the little pen that he was in. And I just wa I would walk up to him real casually and real soft. And he, w he was really enjoyable. Like he wanted to be around people. and But you could tell when he wasn't sure. He wasn't sure about new people. So when he did, I kind of just let him check things out on his own terms. And then he might come up and look at me and then walk off and then eventually he stuck his nose out and he's very he's a very frontal horse like everything that he sees he wants to see it with two eyes and he wants to see it dead straight on the stuff that really bothers him is stuff that gets behind him and so you know that makes it difficult for riding um because everything's from behind getting back to his hind quarters and stuff he wasn't he's not as sure about so when I was, I could tell when I was first working with him that he was very straight on. So I knew that like walking up to his shoulder would push him away. And so I wanted to, that first touch was right on the forehead and it was right where he could see it. And then within a few minutes, you know, he, he started to drop his head. He comes on that watcher line where his head's straight up, but he's like looking at something that's three miles away. And within a few minutes, um, Ruth was actually there that's with us. Um, she got to watch that process as we got and got to do our first introduction together. And uh, he, you know, that first touch was right there. And it was just real soft. I mean, we were there. I got to kind of rub on him a little bit, but we were there to load him up and head him home. So um, we kind of, we directed him in the trailer there shortly thereafter. But it was real calm. I just wanted to kind of, he was kind of checking me out in terms of how he felt about me. And it was the same thing. And, um, he's got a cool spirit about him. So hopefully that clarifies it a little bit. Um, so, oh, you're welcome, Rachel. Absolutely. So let's see. I've got Ruth says, how do I start shooting around my horse? Um, start at a distance with shooting, move closer and closer. Um, good question, Ruth. Um, so, there's quite a few tactics, I guess you could say. Um, it depends on how much help you have. Um, some folks I've seen, Warwick Schiller has a good video, and he actually used an Australian stock whip. He's Australian himself. And so if you're handy with a whip, um, you could use the sound of a stock whip or a bull whip to go about that. And I thought that was an interesting comparison because it does, when you crack one right, it does sound like a gunshot and you can control it um, 
the way I've gone about doing it would be with talking about um, the very basics from the click of the gun before you even have ammunition in it and getting them comfortable with that. And then I would start at a distance. Obviously, you're not shooting. You'd be Everything would be going away from them. And so if you had someone and you wanted to start at further distance, you could have someone else with a firearm um, a ways away. It depends on how sensitive your horse is. And you could have them fire in the direction way away from the horse. And it doesn't have to really even be about the gunfire. It can be just like, oh, that went off in the background. It's kind of like riding a horse and the car backfires. You had nothing to do with it. So it's just like the gun goes off. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, as your horse stays more confident, and you just rub on them each time they stand still. If they move off, then you'd hang in there with them until they, and you just let them and go until they got their feet stopped. You wouldn't keep them moving. You wouldn't push them off. As soon as they stop their feet, you'd rub on them. And then I'd just take them back to where they were, and then don't come any closer until they're comfortable with that. And just keep taking it forward to where you could be standing right next to them and shooting that gun off and... Then if you wanted to do the mounted shooting, then you could take it to the next step and do it from their back. So um, that's a really generalized version. You know, it depends on the sensitivity of the horse and whether you want to do like the stock whip version. If you want to just start with a ways off, you can start with a cap gun. Cap gun's a lot quieter and you could do that in your own hand. And so there's, you know, there's a lot of different ways to go about doing it but I think between the stock whip the cap gun and stuff like that something that emulates the same sound um, obviously use blanks guys <laughs> I hope I don't need to clarify that but definitely use blanks uh, we don't need live rounds so uh, hope that helps and uh, so yep so it sounds like you're on the right track Ruth um, you know sometimes I'd start with small caliber um, I wouldn't go straight to the 45s, you know, but, uh, you know, maybe start with a 22 and then work your way up. Um, yeah, it just depends on what you want to do with them, guys. So, uh, hey there, Monish. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Always appreciate you participating when I ask for questions and comments and stuff like that. It's always good to have folks that like to jump in. Hey there, Anita. You know, you're very welcome. If you got any questions, be sure to let us know. Thanks for joining us this evening. And... Um, guys, as we, if any more questions come in, I'll be sure to answer them. But, um, as it sound, look, kind of looks like we're winding down here. Um, I appreciate all you guys, uh, tuning in. <laughs> Zach, what's up, man? There's my cousin, Zach, up in Indiana. Thanks for tuning in, man. Hope you're doing well. And, uh, so we're going to be putting this video back up on the Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel. Um, be sure to subscribe guys. I, I'm taking videos as much as I can and getting them edited. Uh, we're not going fancy. We're going for content and we want to just give it to you guys. I uh, don't, we're building a bit of a library on YouTube. And so whether you guys have questions that you would like a video on, I've got several videos that I still need to get edited, um, up for you guys, or there's just something in general you'd be curious about seeing. Definitely let me know and we'll get those videos up to you guys. They're full-length videos, and they're usually with the horses I have in training or with Teton or uh, one smart ace is in training, and I'll share a little bit of info on him here in a minute, but we're just trying to give you guys as much information as we can as we go forward, and we're going to be helping with the content, guys, so when you guys come to clinics that you've had a chance to kind of see what I do, um, how my program with the people and the other horses and stuff like that works so that you guys are well prepared and we can kind of get past the lateral flexion stuff because that's all good and well to work on but it's definitely something you guys can be doing at home before we get to the clinic um so with that going on the the uh, youtube is just colton woods horsemanship um you can subscribe there you'll get email for notifications and uh, we've got a newsletter it usually comes out about quarterly and we're all we on the newsletters it's suggested readings the recent videos articles and i've got the blog on the website and my goal is to share as much content with you guys as well as the journey this has been quite the journey so far i didn't grow up around horses i got started with equine rescue and that's where i found my passion for the horsemanship stuff i went through went through the university here in lexington and had that experience and so 
Um, met some phenomenal people along the way. And so many of you guys I've met at different venues, clinics, expos, and stuff like that. So it's always fun, and I'm trying to you know share that journey because I know that um, having been at those events, there's moms and there's um, younger kids that are wanting to chase a dream of doing what they love, working with horses. And you know I've made mistakes. I've also you know made some really good decisions, and you know there's a lot of different ways to go about doing it. So uh, whether you're looking for an internship or a job or you're not sure what you're going to do with your career and you're kind of wondering and you hear this stereotypical stuff about, you know, if you're going to go and be poor in the horse business, well, I don't really like that montage. There's no sense in that. Um, so, you know, we can, I'm all about helping you guys. If you guys have questions, send me a message on Facebook, on the Colton Woods Horsemanship page. Um, send me an email. You know, I'll spend as much time as I can to help you guys out. So it just came up my connections week, so hopefully it's not getting too fluttery on y'all's end. Um, it looks like we got two more questions coming in, so I'll go ahead and get to these. But um, it says, Natalie says, hi, how do you stop from, stop a horse from moving around while you saddle it? I don't hard tie, only a hole on the rope. Um, Natalie, great question. And um, I'm not gonna touch on this again uh, right this second, but um, that was actually one of the first few questions that I answered. And I just put up a video, which is great timing that you asked that. I just put up a video, I think two days ago, about a fidgety horse. And I'll give you just a quick tip on it. You know what it comes down to is counter moves. If that horse moves forward and when you go to saddle him, I wouldn't make a big deal about it. I wouldn't stop him. Like, I'd go and get my saddle out there and you know make sure you get on and then just back him up. If their hindquarter goes out to the left, I move their hind cord back to right, and I pick a spot for my horses, and I say, it's your job to stand here. And, you know, I don't get aggressive. I'm like, oh, you have to stand here. No, it's, you know, this is where you need to stand. This is your job, and I need to be able to move around you. And I, like you said, you said you don't hard time. I only hold on the rope. That's exactly what I would do. Um, I'm not a fan of, you know, hard time saddling them, having a little freak out moment, and then being hard tied. You know, that's just a disaster. And, you know, gosh forbid that, you know, they get scarred up pretty bad mentally and then you might wreck your tax. So that's never good. But um, definitely check out the first uh, part of this live stream. We're going to put it back up on the Facebook page and on the YouTube channel. And then as well, check out, it's just, it's a real quick three or four minute video that I put up the other day and that should really help you out. But counter moves, you know, pick a spot for them. And then if they don't stand there, just have a counter or counter move to them. Uh, Sherry. Are you participating in the rescue competition, Western 100 Days with the Rescue Horse? You know, I'm not participating in any, um, I won't say any competitions. I'm not participating um, in particularly that one. That one was a new one to me that I haven't heard of. And uh, Natalie, you're absolutely welcome. Hope that sure helped. And I'm not, I haven't heard of the one in West Virginia, but I don't have any plans in doing um, perfect. Thanks for sending that link through. Uh, I'll definitely check it out in terms of the dates and stuff. But right now, um, my passion, guys, is to be helping you guys and with your horses. I'm riding horses for the public during the week. We've got clinics. We've got one here in Kentucky in April. We've got one in North Carolina in May. And um, then we've got, we've got one book that's not out yet, but I'll go ahead and tell you guys. We've got one coming up in Indiana the 1st of June. And then we've got a real special one here back in Kentucky in July. And we'll have new information on that one for you guys next week. It's going to be a bit of a joint clinic, so it's going to be super fun. And then one up in Ohio that we're still figuring out the dates for, but that one's going to be in the fall. And that's going to be, I think, about October. So we're getting some clinics. Um, if you guys are looking for your area, if I didn't name off any areas that you guys are in and you want a clinic, definitely be sure to get in touch or at least send a comment and I'll send you a message. But uh, the competitions, guys, they take a lot, um, and those horses deserve those second chances. Like, I, that's where I got started was rescue horses, and so I have an immense passion for what people do. And um, I have one, like, a very deep passion for those rescue horses and what they do, so I don't, um, I haven't dedicated any time to the Mustang ones or the Thoroughbred or anything like that. It's been on my mind, but I really want to work with you guys on your horsemanship education with the with developing your own skills and 
as well as your horses so that you guys can kind of keep progressing in the routes that whether you want to go compete in the dressage arena, reining, cutting, you know, trail riding, whatever, whatever suits your fancy, um, uh, hunter jumpers, you know, like whatever it is, um, you know, I want to help you guys get those skills kind of going. So Sherry says, I look forward to meeting you. Oh uh, yeah. Ariana is a great, great friend of mine. Um, if y'all haven't heard of her, definitely check out. She's in that star search for the Mid Midwest Horse Fair, and uh, she is going to be something else. She's got a real cool little mare that she's been working with, and she's super, super talented. So if you guys are wanting to teach your horses to lay down, um, I really, I've been using her system with my horses, and she's got a great DVD on it. So ArianaSecurious.com, and uh, you guys can be hooked up there. Kathy, um, I did, Kathy. I did. It's um, probably in the first half of the video at this point, and um, I appreciate you sending that question in, and so we did address that, so definitely be sure to check it out. Uh, Anita, let's see. Do you have any experience with gated horses, Rocky Mountains in particular? Never ridden him with a long shank or a solid mouthpiece, but broken snaffle copper center short shank is it incorrect to drop back to to see more a deering snaffle so good question um just a couple things in my snaffles i do like copper inlays you know it's there for them to help them salivate and so we that is my preference in the snaffle uh, like i was saying earlier my tack literally my tack room is made up of a deering snaffle a Hackamore, a Rawhide 5.8 Hackamore, and a Mona Lisa bit, which is a ported bit with a shank, and it's the introduction to the spade bit, which I haven't even used yet. So, um, I'm not much of a bit collector, guys. You know, I would, I'm spending my money on going to clinics and learning from other people. Um, I try to keep it pretty simple. And so, when it comes to shanks, though, there's a couple different rules of thumbs that I like to address. And... Are they solid shanks or are they hinged? The hinge shanks will allow you to have more lateral, which is really big for, you know, one rein stops. But however, your reins are attached to a shank, so you're already going to get a, a leverage that instead of them bending exactly straight to the left or to the right, they're going to bend like this. And they're, so if, my, if this is their head, instead of them going straight left and straight right and keeping their ears flat they're going to go like this and they're going to crank their head and you know it's a different feel and so when i suggest to people to be working with their horses on in terms of things i like to go to a d-ring snaffle um, most people that are riding in shanks honestly just don't need to be um, so that's my thought on it you know everyone had there's a time and a place for them i suppose but there you shouldn't be using a shank because your horse lunked out of a snaffle you know they should be progressing to something per se as a shank that allows you to have you know that a shank that has less lateral and more vertical and that only reason you would do that is because you have more control you have enough control of them in terms of their lateral obedience that you're willing to give that up to move on to the next step um so that's my thought. I know that it may not be a very popular answer, and you know, but that's my take on it. And so, um, I'm real big on the D-ring snaffles. Um, keep it pretty simple. So, um, you're welcome, Kathy. Absolutely. Thanks for that question. And so, um, we'll go. I guess we'll go ahead and um, we'll see. We've been going pretty good here, guys. Uh, do you guys have any other questions before we wrap things up? It's been a good evening. Uh, it's been fun to see everybody that's tuning in, some good friends, family, and, you know, new friends and old friends. So um, we've really, I've really enjoyed this. We'll definitely have to, definitely have to do it again. If you found it helpful, please let us know. Um, if there was something that you thought we should touch on or we'd do differently, um, definitely, definitely let me know. This is our first go at it and we're we're learning as we go so hopefully they just get better and better each time kathy says another gated horse question my mare is working softly at the walk how do i transition to the next gate and not go upside down okay my mare is working softly 
Hello, Tristan. So, you know, all right, um, I've got a good friend, I would say, um, Michael Gascon. He's your gated horse kind of, he's your gated horse specialist. And um, if you've guys seen the Pasifinos with the dinosaurs on their back, that's him. Uh, he's, you know, he's into the Pasifinos and the gated horses and stuff like that. And he's a very good horseman as well. Um, you know, but honestly, and this is just my experience, I'm treating the horses as a horse. You know, your question to me, in terms of how do you go from a soft walk to a soft, soft walk to a soft trot, doesn't really have much to do with, you know, whether they're gated or whether they're per se normal for a lack of better terms. Um, what going on a loose rein and having them um, just moving forward, you know, if you're, if sometimes they just need a trot. The trot is one of the best gates to work at in getting them comfortable and going relaxed, moving forward and dropping their head. And, you know, if she feels like she's getting worried at it, then we need to diagnose not what she's doing, but why she's doing it, you know, is, and it's, you know, that's a question that, you know, without actually seeing what is going on, it's really, really tough to, you know, give you a bit of a direction on it because, you know, it could be in any number of things, you know, but it's, if you have her going softly at the walk, um, I, and I don't, if you're riding with contact, then I would be more apt to let them go forward on a loose rein and let her kind of feel it and then get in and help them and then get out. Don't feel like micromanaging them because that will make them braced and worried about everything. So, um, I'm real big on riding on a loose rein, get in, help them. If they're cutting the corners, then you need to know, help them lift them in the shoulders and help them bend around those turns, but then get out. And then if you get back to that turn again and you feel like they're going to do it, help them out, set them up and then give them, give them the responsibility to do it. Um, we're working together with them, but we're both responsible for quite a bit. And, you know, we want them to be confident in themselves that so we don't want them to depend on us for our self-confidence and they can keep looking back to us for some leadership and confidence if they start to get unsure. But, you know, Kathy, uh, if you want to send me some videos of your mare, if, um, if you can get something like that, that might be a bit of a better way to go about answering your question. I definitely want to help you out there, but you know, it's it, you know, it could just be so many things that I'm not exactly sure right offhand how I could, possibly send you in the right direction so but i definitely want to help you out so send me some videos or send me a little more information and we'll get you squared away anita asks when you want more collection with d-ring snaffle do you lift your hands up or hold down like west butter um so i'll ignore the second half of that question but um um in terms of the you know when i ask for more collection so my collection first you know Collection is a very, very sophisticated thing, but we're working on soft feel. So when I first start to teach my colts to do it, I'm asking them to back up in a soft feel. And so at first it's, you know, ask them and then move their feet. But then eventually they should be able to back up with a bit of vertical flexion in the pole and they move back. Once they start to understand that, then maybe I could ask them to back up and then maybe ride forward into that without bracing and pushing on my hands and you know they will for until they understand that they can move and still maintain that softness and then you'll be riding and then you might be walking and you pick up on the reins and you say hey and they're going to think you're going to go back because you have walked so many times around the arena and through the arena you picked up on them and got a soft feel and you backed them up that every time you backed them up you asked for that soft feel and then eventually you will um, be walking forward and you'll pick up on that soft feel and they're going to go, oh, we're going backwards and you're going to put some leg on. You're like, oh no, you're going to go forward because then you're like, you've already asked them to back up and then walk forward back into it. And now they're just going from a loose rein into a walk and going forward. Um, in terms of my hand position, my hands are out in front of me. They're typically in front of the saddle horn or in front of the cannel, depending on what kind of saddle you're riding in. And... You know, I'm not lifting up. It's in my fingers, and it's a feel. 
Um, it's, I challenge everybody to go out and really feel how soft your horse can be. I, I, there are days where I still got in the arena and I pick up on one of them and I'm like, and they have a whole new level of softness and it's, you know, it's a feeling that when you feel it, you're pretty amazed that it was there and it's like, how much have you been missing or you haven't even seen before because that one day you went looking for it and you found it and you realized there was so much more there than there was. Um, so it's, my hands don't dictate, you know, there are times where I can, I heard it described as floating the rein where my hands move. And a lot of times that is dependent on where their shoulders are going or where their head is moving, um, that I'm having to go with them. But when it does come, my hands usually re remain in a steady position because I want the bit to be in the corners of their mouth. I don't want it to be on the bars of their mouth. You push on the bars of their mouth, they're going to brace against you. But you lift on the corners of their mouth, and it's a lot softer feel. So that, I hope that helps. And, you know, that could be a very good um, video topic in terms of just talking about the basics of getting a soft feel and asking a horse to round up. So... Um, thanks for that. Uh, Nita, let me know if that helps. Um, glad you found some humor in the first part of that answer. And, uh, Kathy said, appreciate it. I want to see. Yep, absolutely. So, uh, Kathy, definitely be sure to send us, um, some videos there. And, uh, all right, guys. So it looks like numbers are dwindling. It's, you know, it's creeping past nine o'clock and I've got to, I've got to be up early to get the ponies fed in the morning and everything like that. So I appreciate everybody tuning in. Be sure to um, go subscribe to the YouTube channel. That's where this video is going to be going up. And we'll be um, as also having it here on our Facebook page so that we can um, keep you guys updated. This was really a lot of fun. Um, it doesn't feel like it's been an hour or so that we've been going. And it's it's great to have your guys' interaction. The questions definitely help, and it's, it's making it super enjoyable. And it's a good way to interact with you guys because I get to go to the barn and uh, teach lessons to myself and talk to people that aren't actually in the arena so I can practice and uh, work with the horses. And So um, thank you guys for tuning in. And if you got any questions, be sure to let us know. Send us a message. Post in the comments below. And we're going to keep going. Um, we've got... I'm trying to post for you guys that might be on it. We've got the Snapchat going, and I like to post the behind-the-scenes stuff um, with the horses every day. It's a good way to see how that's going. We've got our Instagram account that, um, you know, and all of our accounts are posting different information. The Facebook has a lot of the educational stuff, but our Instagram um, has definitely been a hit, and we've really been enjoying doing that. So um, we'll be booking clinics, guys. Like I said, we're going to be riding with Peter Campbell in March here in Kentucky. Uh, we've got a clinic in April, and that's here in Kentucky as well, up in LaGrange at Circle Bar C, and that's going to be a great time. And then we've got a clinic uh, 19th to the 21st of, of May, and that's in my hometown of High Point, North Carolina. And we are also going to be doing um, a clinic in Indiana, LaPorte, Indiana, at Transitions Equestrian Center, and that's the 1st of June. We've got a really exciting joint clinic coming up with more information on that here back in Kentucky with another phenomenal horseman. And as soon as we got the details on that, we'll be sharing that with you guys. And then also um, a great clinic up in Ohio in the fall. Probably we're looking about the October time frame. So um, if you guys are somewhere that those doesn't, that doesn't cover, let us know. Uh, we're always looking to come to you guys and... Uh, hope that helps guys thanks for tuning in y'all have a great evening sarah would love to come back to maine uh really enjoyed y'all's place up at wendy's and so um send me a message or i'll send you one yeah just go ahead and send me a message and maybe we can talk with wendy about getting up to maine that would be a lot of fun um great crew up there guys so uh thanks for tuning in y'all have a great evening and then we'll talk to you guys soon